And uh, here we have the new Canon uh, mirrorless. So hi, so who are you? I'm Mike Bernhill. I am the sort of product specialist for the EOS R and many other Canon products. And uh, this is a 50mm prime? This is the 50mm uh, RF 1.2. It's our new sort of one of our new um, demonstration lens of what the new RF mount is capable of regarding resolution, etc. So what's the, the spec on that one? It's a f1.2 that's very, very bright. It's very bright. It's probably the fastest autofocus lens uh, for any mirrorless camera that's currently on the market. Um, again, this lens is all about resolution and providing the ultimate sort of image quality, but still being able to have a very fast aperture of 1.2. Very, very fast, but is it uh, is it going to be expensive? Uh, well, well, it, it's all comparative, I suppose. It, uh, it's a little bit more expensive than the existing uh, 50mm 1.2s already on the market. So, um, but again, it's a brand new lens, and you know, image quality um, comparisons with anything near the image quality of this are vastly more expensive than this. So, this is almost a bargain if you want to look at picture quality wise. And. Uh, so this new uh, full-frame mirrorless is a big, big deal, right? For Canon, for the industry. Oh well, this is the start of a new journey for Canon and our customers. It's introducing our new RF mount, which opens up a whole range of new potentials for products going forward. Um, yeah, just so I can see. Uh, so, so it's um, uh, full frame uh, with the. It's a full frame sensor. Yeah, it uses our sort of uh, our dual pixel CMOS technology. Uh, which allows us to do amazing AF functionality. So we have the ability to focus down to minus six yeah. EV, yeah. Um, which is kind of you know, really, really dark. It's like shooting in almost pitch black. Uh, we have an amazing 565 and 55 AF positions you can select. So basically you can select anywhere you want and it's exactly where you want to select. Um, and again, the AF chip and the new 24105 when combined, that's the fastest AF of any sort of camera on the market. Can we power it on? Of course we can. Yeah. So it's got the switch right there, and it has uh, something a lot of people like. Yeah, it's the flip uh, display. Yeah, the, 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 the old uh, very angle display. So if you're, you know, sort of vlogging or any other self-portraits, you can actually see what, what is going some on. Some companies don't do that for some reason. It's the having this again, the patent on the hinge and the mechanisms of you're worried about the body size, thickness, you know. Uh, but you know, we've always had this sort of uh, many of our products. Uh, we feel it's the best way to you know, allow a lot of people to shoot at different angles. You know, you can shoot, you know, shoot down, you can shoot up, and, or I can shoot, yeah. You know, so this is just the start, you say, right? Yeah, this is the start. This this is not US R one? No, it's just well, R. We, at R, we, we don't. We, we kind of, we don't want to, you know, we will slowly build the line. We do want to position the camera in any particular one position to give, say, this is our, you know, this is a 5D or 6D replacement. It's about starting the journey and starting at a point in the R is kind of introducing the whole RF, R system. So it's got uh, dual pixel AF. Yeah. Can, we, can we go down here? Because yeah. they're, they're going to start live streaming here too. Let me just kind of try. Right. Maybe let's, let's sit right here. Yeah. So it's got a the very, very powerful and precise autofocus. Yes. For video too. But yeah, again, we've introduced the same technology a while back in our C300 and C200. The dual pixel runs through all the sort of Canons of products. It's kind of one of our unique kind of technologies that no one else has. Um, and obviously for video, you can use the same touch screen to pull focus between two points and that speed is varied. Uh, depending on the menu settings, so you get a nice smooth focus pull if you want to, or you can have an instantaneous kind of response. So these are the sort of options that are available. Um, so th th there's just a couple of things people are kind of uh, criticizing on the internet: the single card slot yeah. and the crop in 4K. Yeah. But uh, but you're saying it's the first one, so there might be some more video-centric yeah, totally. yeah. versions. This, the pro this product is aimed at the kind of photo enthusiast. This is its core market it was designed for. And when we were looking at designing it, we were looking at the feature set that customer set wants. So the important things for those customers were great AF, compatibility with their existing EF system, a good EVF. Um, these kind of things were high priority. Uh, what was lower priority for those type of customers from feedback, and you could saw the same sort of feedback 
on things like DP Review, etc. They did the same sort of surveys and canon rumors that card slots were lower on their priority. And obviously video, you know, only about 20% of this market are really into video. 4K is even smaller percentage. So looking at what feature set were important to the customer, we prioritize those over something else. So we prioritize having a better EVF over maybe having you know, a four frame 4K sensor because that will appeal to more customers and they will find that more useful than the four frame 4K. But there is a potential that maybe, so the video guys but perhaps could wait a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And maybe there's going to be uh, like uh, one with IBIS also. Yeah, we totally understand. Because IBIS is a big yeah, deal yeah, too. Yeah, we totally understand what the video market wants. And then, you know, again, this is not maybe the product for them. And we will obviously look at, you know, introducing products either either end of this sort of product, you know, entry level that will be easier to use. And we'll look at higher end ones and we'll look at video focused ones. And we'll look at those features. So like, you know, a video focused one or a professional one will have dual card slots because that's what those markets need. And again, IBIS is something we, uh, we're looking at and we understand them in the video industry. It's much more important for vlogging like yourself, they see the benefit. But for a lot of um, entry level photographers who are shooting like landscapes, but this sort of product will fit in very nicely in portraits, that is less of a priority. So it's putting the technologies and features in that will appeal to them and not affect the pricing. Because again, pricing is kind of yeah, there's no point having a product that is perfect for a market if it's twice the price of what the market's willing to pay for it. And I just did an awesome video about the new camcorder XF705. Yeah. And it has H265, 4210 bit internal, yeah. 4K60. Yeah. All this stuff would be so cool in there. Yeah, again, this is technology we're slowly moving towards. Potentially, and right? Potentially. But yeah, and again, it doesn't really fit into the core demographic where this was really going to sell towards. But yeah, we totally get it and we see, you know, we're talking to the broadcasters and these new codecs have um, great possibilities to transmit videos and edit and all these getting smaller, you know, it's slowly moving forward and this is obviously a fantastic product to launch these technologies at the high end. But as you see with this product, it's more 62 pricing, uh, but it brings some of the technology from the 5D4 with the more expensive camera down. And that's what Canon often do, we take the technology from the high end and we bring it into a lower end. And we also we like to kind of introduce products in the mid-range area because that's a bigger user base and they will use the product more than professionals. They'll provide great feedback that will help steer us in a better direction where the market will go and what the product should do. One other thing I saw is that people said that it would be nice if there was something else here than just an on-off switch. That's just maybe, maybe you're getting a lot of uh, uh, feedback. Uh, and you could, uh, because uh, the, maybe you can yeah. just have an on-off switch somewhere else. And usually people have a dial here, but uh, you're able to do as much as a dial with, the, with this new well, setup? You can actually, with the dial, you've only got two things. You're going to spin it around one way or another. With this, you've actually got three operations. You can either stroke it across or you can tap either end. So you can actually set three different functionalities. So for example, ISO, I can change my ISO by stroking this, or I can tap this to go to my favorite ISO, or I tap that end to go to auto ISO. So you can actually set different parameters, or I can do this for white balance. So you can set your two different white balance temperatures either side, if you wanted to. Or you can mix and match it. So I tap one end, it can be focus, eye focus. I can stroke this to change my white balance. Or I tap that and it goes to my favorite ISO. So you can really mix and match this control into doing more than one thing. A dial, you can either go left or right. It can't do, you know, can't be so many up controls. and down also and well yeah you know, with dial it's going around but it's ah. only controlling one thing I mean, you're maybe it's the the joystick i guess a, a, a focus on. control yeah. joystick but obviously one of the joys of the the new camera the new new types of interfaces that yeah. we're introducing is this is a touch screen so yeah. this actually becomes a mouse pad so when you're using the viewfinder i can use my thumb to drag the af point around the screen yeah so i can set the af point anywhere i want much quicker than i could with a joystick it's kind of, a, I'm just doing that. It's very organic. With a joystick, you've only got mechanical switches, so you're moving in jumps. Here, it's very fluid, and it's very smooth uh, and seamless operation. So, and again, coupled with the 5,000 AF points, um, wherever I set the AF point, that's where it focuses. It's not slightly to the left, not slightly to the right, but exactly that position. There's maybe a potential that people with their nose, they might activate stuff on the screen. No, no that's not, not gonna really? happen. No, no, again, again there's a little sensor that turns that off. But okay. obviously the joy he's talking about big noses is that the fact that this has the largest eye point of any of the mirrorless cameras on the market. So therefore your eye doesn't have to be as close to the viewfinder as with say other cameras and you still get the 100% viewfinder view. Yep. So again, so the, yeah, nose so, touching is not an issue. 
So uh, yeah, but it's exciting. You get into into the the, the full frame mirrorless. Yeah. What do you think is going to be the market share of mirrorless compared to DSLR? Well, I think what's interesting about mirrorless versus DSLR is that it's um, why you see so many cameras coming today is the fact that. Um, mirrorless wasn't quite universal across the world. People made a lot of noise in different areas, but those, if you went back to the DSLR days, you could apply the same rule across many countries. So how many cameras sold in the USA, you could times or divide by number to work out in another country. It was quite universal. It was very similar sort of you know, how it worked. But mirrorless, it all went all kind of um, weird. So in Japan, it was very high, but US was very low. Although there's a lot of noise in the US, sales were very, very low considering DSLRs. And now we're seeing that slow shift. It's sort of more stabilizing across globally. So that's why you see so many mirrorless cameras being launched at this trade show. Um, but again, customers will decide which cameras kind of, you know, go forward. We see some markets still very traditionalist in SLRs. Yeah. That's what they've educated, that's what they've kind of traditionally kind of know and there is a cultural side to what they expect from a camera. Um, so we'll see other markets maybe flip very quickly to mirrorless, but other markets take a lot longer. And basically the customer will decide, not sort of Canon, etc., uh, if a mirrorless lives and DSLR dies. Because uh, uh, maybe Canon is a little bit careful about can not cannibalizing the DSLR market when, when this product was conceived or not necessarily? It's no, just uh, providing we, what's out there, we, I, in, letting in, consumer in, choose? In, yeah, exactly. In the past, we might have been quite conservative, but again, we've brought features from the 5D4 into this price point, and we're pricing it at a lower price point, more like a 62. So that's got obviously going to affect sales of the 5D4 and the 62. So, you know, we, we can't really be scared of cannibalizing sales. If we're scared of cannibalizing sales, there are other companies out there who actually will happily eat into our sales for us. Um, They're working very hard to get people to move over to exactly, the Exactly, yeah. So, you know, so, you know, if we don't do something, if we're too conservative and we're worried, then we're, it's a lose-lose situation. So we have to be brave and accept that, you know, not everyone will want this product and maybe someone wants this product. But giving customers a choice is not a bad thing. You know, it's only can only be good for a customer. So uh, uh, I think Sony in the press conference said something about you know they have lots of lenses, yeah. but their their mount is a little bit smaller. Yeah. And they they claim that it's not an advantage to have a bigger one, but it's not true. Or well, is there some? Uh, for example, you can do stuff that's better with this size mount. But the bit. To go back to basic optical principles, the best lens you can have is basically a, a glass that's roughly the same size as the sensor, fairly close up. Therefore, the light from that glass hits the sensor straight. By having a smaller rear element, you're actually having to bend light to the corners. When you're bending light, this is where you get the chromatic aberration on the sensor, the purple fringing and vignetting and all these issues. So having that large mount means we can have a large rear diameter optic that would allow the light to travel straight to the sensor. Um, so it gives you much more flexibility in your design, you're not constrained. The problem with lens design is, to fix things, you put a piece of glass in, and every piece of glass you put in creates another problem that you then have to correct. And you know, it's a kind of compromise with how many pieces of glass you're willing to put in to get the ultimate performance and not knock out another performance. So you can improve sharpness, but that may affect uh, stigmatism. So you, you're doing all this kind of balancing so it's trying to make the lens design as simple as possible, therefore provide the best quality. And having that large diameter means we can move the optics further back into the mount and have them still having quite large that covers the full frame sensor. And uh, um, uh, this has new high performance kind of generation of autofocus compared to the DSLR lenses? Or? Well, it's coupled, yeah, there, is, there are two things that drive is forward there is the new dual pixel sensor dual pixel CMOS sensor it says um, that is one of the things so uh, it gives us the fantastic number of um, AF positions it also allows a low light ability but what the key thing on, on this whole system is the new RF mount so it's not just about the size the diameter but it's the whole principle of things you know the fact that the information that travels between here and the body is many 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 times faster than previous lenses so therefore the whole speed system is faster. Um, there's also the processors in the lens. So when we zoom, for example, with the zoom lenses, the aperture system automatically adjusts itself 
in the, in the old system, the camera told the lens what to do, and that caused a delay. But you know with these sort of 24 105s, when you zoom, you'll see a slight flicker as, the, as you zoom because the aperture is changing to compensate for the zoom. And that is because there's a delay between the mechanism in the camera and the lens communicating. Now the lenses know what's happening and can compensate that in real time. So therefore you see very little flicker between the systems. The aperture system in these new lenses is also designed to work an eighth of a stop. So again, for video operations going forward, you can move in very small increments and get very seamless exposure change than most of the systems. So most of the lens systems only move in a quarter or a third of a stop. So if you change your aperture, you will get a slight pulse in the exposure as it kind of varies brightness. But with an eighth of a stop, that becomes almost seamless. So you don't notice any flashing or strobing as you change aperture. So there's lots of little communication things that we're building into these lenses for the future that may not be visible today, you know. There are many more contacts than we're using. There are 12 contacts, but some of these can support higher data rates and more power than in previous lenses, so we can do more going forward. If you think of the EF mount when we introduced it in 87, it was designed for a camera with one single AF point. Um, and now, you know, we've got hundreds or thousands of AF points going forward and cinema EOS and uh, you know, shooting video and digital we weren't even thought about when that mount was created but that mount uh, you know, survived and allowed these sort of systems to develop and what we wanted to do is make a mount that can do the same for the future so trying to incorporate technology that may not be available today but allow expansion to do other things in the future. So it's future proof? Yeah we're trying to make it as future proof as possible it's, it's always a, you know, totally impossible to uh, see what the future will hold but we can try to put as many systems in place that act, allow expansion that won't cause bottlenecks in the future which means we have to scrap a system and start again by making the system as open and advanced in, in, in sort of its communication protocols that allow much more to be done again things like the control ring on here like every lens now has a control ring which can be customized to either be the aperture shutter speed exposure compensation or iso so this gives you another direct control interface to a, a control that you want. And if you want to, it clicks, which is great for the intended market, but it can be de-clicked if you want it to be used for video. And this is also extended into the adapters. Obviously, there are three adapters uh, on launch. There's a standard adapter that allows EF lenses to be used. There is an adapter with a control ring. So if you are using EF lenses, you get the same operation across all your lenses. You'll be able to con adapt or change your speed or aperture from the lens and the third adapter has a drop-in filter holder which will sell two kits of one with a variable ND and one with a circular polarizer which means you know again great for video but also great for landscape and architectural photographers who are using very wide angle lens like the TSC 17 or 11 to 24 which have these very big curvature lenses so you can't attach filters um, so now you can actually apply a polarizer to a landscape or architectural and again or variable, variable uh, neutral density if you want to do a long exposure to blare up people moving around etc. But so those adapters are not going to make magic in like uh, pr bringing all these functions to all the older lenses right? No, uh, the new native uh, R lenses have something to step up. Yeah again it's, it's all about designing that new language so, so the new high-speed protocols and processes are all in the new lenses because of the change in the body depth between the old system, the new lenses won't physically fit on uh, because of the mount design, but also because they wouldn't focus on affinity. You know, again, they, they, they'll be too close to the sensor, so you wouldn't be able to use them anyway to get, you know, for many usages anyway. Um, but the adapters allow all the EF series lenses to be used on this camera. In fact, one of the things we're proud of is the, in our caveats for what lenses you can't use, there is really only one lens that we say is not fully compatible and that's a EF 35 to 80 f4 56 power zoom lens from 1991 and that lens the power zoom doesn't work but everything else works so every lens we've launched since 1987 will work as well on this camera or, or if not better because you'll have the low light ability um, but what would be the uh, video autofocus speed on, on all these older lenses Again, the, obviously those motors weren't designed for video, so they're, they're designed for still, so they're kind of, they're not smooth, they're stop-start, they were designed for still, so you kind of got to that position very quickly. If you want to describe it as like an early camcorder kind of lens, you kind of jumped focus, because that's what you needed to do for still, you wanted to be 
see the outer focus or sharp, that's what we need. You don't need that nice transition through. So again, using the new motors like the Nano USM, the new ring types and the new STMs, they're all these days geared towards video. So giving you a nice smooth kind of focus change. But we've kind of, you know, if you want to do that kind of with the older lenses, you can still manual focus. So we've incorporated technology we've borrowed from the Cinema EOS. So we've got the focus guide, which is a nice little manual indicator that tells you where you're near or front focused and you can manually focus with that. And obviously it's a really good focus speaking as well. And uh, 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 so you, you have three lenses, did you... Four lenses. Four. 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 And do you announce how many is going to be in the next uh, few No, time? again, uh, we've never, kind of never really introduced a roadmap. The problem with lenses are, they are quite complex beasties. So when they slip on the roadmap, you know, if something's not going right, it, you have to redesign the mechanics. It's not something you can fix overnight in software. You have to go back. So roadmaps fluctuate quite a lot. So we didn't want to promise something that we wouldn't be able to deliver. Uh, but we are committed to producing three uh, next year, three 2.8 kind of the trilogy lenses. So your kind of uh, long 7200 type and 24 70s and 1635 type series will kind of be introduced next year. And there are other lenses we are hoping to introduce, but with lens design, it's never as easy to say we can guarantee when it will come out. So we don't want to kind of make a promise we can't keep. And when, the, when are you delivering? Of the camera? Yeah. The sales start is the first week of October. So that's like uh, next week? Basically, that means yeah. means people can get it or just pre-order? Uh, Pre-order is available now and the first shipment from the factory, from the factory to the dealers, etc. will start the, it's the first week of October. So I, it depends on what region you're in. So I think sales start is looking around about the 9th, depending nice. on the country. And uh, can you give me an exclusive? So for the, the video version that has 4K60, no crap, and uh, iBase and all that? No, I'm joking. <laughs> but hopefully, there will be yeah, again, soon. Yeah, we're, Maybe. We're, not, uh, we're not deaf. We've been obviously you know, listening to uh, yeah. things on the internet and people were saying, and we totally get what they want, and it's far, yeah. But unfortunately, it's kind of yeah. an invented dual as slots. Yeah, we had it in you the 1D, it the 1D2, yeah. Yeah, we had it in the 1D Mark, uh, the 1D Mark II, and we totally get why it's important and why people need it. Yeah. But all the research showed for the target market for this product, that even if they've got cameras with a dual card slot, they're only putting one card yeah. in because they're taking photos for themselves. But well, if you're a photo professional business and where you know, images are your money and you lose all the images, you don't get paid, dual cards make perfect sense. And once that product is aimed at those guys, yeah, of course, yeah, it will, it's going to have dual card slots. But we don't want to put pro features into the camera that people don't won't, won't use. Um, it's better to concentrate on the stuff that they will use, or something that will make their life easier, like better autofocusing or you know usability or the interfaces. These are things that will affect everyday users and will affect 100% of the customer base, rather than kind of a smaller percentage. But yeah, you know, if, if there's a video oriented camera, we will kind of look at all these kind of wish lists and try to get as many of those features in. And uh, if you needed uh, to do no crap 4K video, that needs a new sensor design, right? So yeah, again, that some, maybe a sensor that's not yet in the Canon portfolio. Yeah, you need to have a, a new sensor. You need the new uh, high-tech processors. The, yeah, uh, the to not overheat the heat. Well, the, yeah, yeah, we're kind of getting it with this body of how we're kind of designing the system. And it, yeah. it gives us this ability to because it uses electric. Uh, exoskeleton so there is most cameras have a, a chassis inside and everything is hung off the chassis and you would bolt the outside to it this is basically the, the outside is, is the skeleton and everything is attached to the inside so you've got direct access to the heat points of the outside of the body so it's we're learning on these kind of technologies to you know we can take them forward into the next products and uh, have those issues addressed before we get to them cool but uh, awesome uh very exciting photo Kina. very cool there's so much new stuff happening yeah it's, it's great it's never been such an exciting time you know there's been you know i don't think it's been a photo Kina that's been this exciting for many years where there is so many products for customers to choose from that they have a scope which is great you know having competition is good for canon because it drives us to be better you know and we, we can't be complacent um and you know and it's it's a very good time for the industry and it's so the industry is still live you know that photography isn't dead smartphones haven't taken over dual people, pixel is awesome dual pixel is one of our crown jewels it does allow us to do stuff that other manufacturers can't and it it basically can only get better in fact you know one of my amusing stories is you know dual pixel was actually 
started by the engine, Canon Engineers in 1981. 81? 81. If we go back to the history books in 81, we introduced the sort of um, the AL1 and we had these like zoom lenses that had a AF sensor in. And the engineers worked out, oh, we could use a CMOS, a CCD, and actually use that for measuring focusing. But then they worked up the cost and the processing. So they put that to one side and they went through a basic kind of a measuring sensor. And then we got into the EOS 650 and they thought, Oh, on this project, we maybe we could look at CCD again to do dual pixel to work out focusing. Again, time, cost, processing was too much. And then we got into the digital era uh, with a, you know, so when we got to the D30, and that's when we kind of went, actually, now is the time we can start to look at this technology. And that's when we kind of went back to focus on it, and then we've been fine tuning it ever since. Nice. So th thanks a lot for this interview. No it's awesome. I have to stop because I'm filming on the Sony and it's <laughs> it's just about to overheat. Oh, okay. No, I'm joking. Uh, the 30, <laughs> 30 minute limit, which you, you don't you have a 30 minute limit yeah, also. Yeah, 30 limit is it's really kind of at the moment it's most of the EU cameras. Tax, right? EU tax, but yeah. Maybe there's a way to sell a plugin, let people unlock the unlimited, or maybe not. Not uh, yet. Yeah, I think the problem is, you know, there is a problem. Is as the cameras become more popular, it, it basically becomes more difficult because. Um, it's all down to like number of units sold and how many people want it and how many people want it so we well, you know maybe you know, after brexit maybe uh, the yeah, yeah. there'll be like a uk be no version yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> why brexit was voted i think yeah, maybe it's because of the eu yeah. tax on the no it's all, it was all to do with the 30 minute recording yeah so yeah. Uh, everyone in the uk will have like yeah infinite okay. recording and those people in uh, mainland europe will be stuck with a uh, 30 minutes right. so, joking cool. thank you okay, <laughs> okay. Cool.